fire it up uh, by default the first time, um, it'll come up with digital 2 d So it's already recognized that there's a digital antenna attached. And it's going to make it, so it just assumes you're going to do just normal 2 d uh, single profiles that aren't going to be related to each other necessarily. Um, we can click on it and then rotate the bezel. Uh, click on it and rotate the bezel. We can choose 3 d uh, I believe if we do a 3D survey and we shut the system down, <coughs> I think we need to power it up again and we'll just come up with the 3D as a default. Um, those are the only modes. You'll see in the background here, you can maybe just make out structure scan 3D, um, and then there's another one. Uh, I don't know what this is. Anyway, yeah, structure scan. If we had a different antenna attached to this, to this uh, a 1.6 gigahertz antenna, then uh, that menu would be available to us as well. So it actually recognizes that uh, the, the settings in that in that portion of the menu system do not apply to this antenna. That's clever enough to figure that out. Um, so let's just keep it simple. You're going to do a, a 2D survey, you're going to go and say 2D. Um, Start with a new project, which is the first thing. So we can go in and we can type in um, uh, what project. So I'm lazy, I just let it do it by default. If we do project one, the next, next project will be project two, which you can actually go and change it uh, by just selecting. So you just press the, the rotation knob down and you can just go through the, the um, menu, select it, move on to the next one, same thing. I'm just going to leave it with project one. Uh, um, once we're happy, um, we go down to apply. There we go. So now it's, it's got a basic uh, set of settings, default settings that uh, uh, it uses. So what we're seeing here is basically it's now operating, so it's transmitting and receiving, uh, but it's just not storing the data. Right? So everything's horizontal because we're measuring the same point underneath us. But if this, we should see a change in the data. You can actually see the data there. So what we have here, uh, so radar grams are, they have nomenclature for radar grams. Uh, what we're looking at here is what is known as, uh, I'll start with the following. This oscilloscope trace basically is trace number one. So it's the first trace that we're looking at. And it's just, you see it scrolling through. So we're just magnifying one trace. Um, and it's called the uh, A. Sorry, this is the this is the A A scope. Um, and so what it does, it tells us if this is stable, we know that there's relatively little noise. In uh, areas where you've got the you're trying to get maximum depth out of it, you'll notice the bottom end of this, and you'll see it later. The bottom end of this will start to oscillate backwards and forwards, which is basically a, a fact that we're measuring environmental noise. And the noise is as, as very, very similar uh, amplitudes to the signal we're trying to measure. So that's a useful thing to have. This little red line here is the gain curve. Uh, you guys familiar with gain? Uh, amplification of the signal. So we're just applying an amplification to the signal. Uh, this, perp, this pink line here is the zero. So what actually happens is the signal that's reflecting off the, the, the surface here the, is uh, relatively high, so we actually uh, turning it down. We, uh, we're reducing the decibels in that. Um, and this is a, a one, two, three point system. So we've got one anchor there, one anchor there, and a, another anchor over here. Uh, we can change the number of points. I think we can go to eight, and I'll show you that just now. Um, but that is the gain curve that we are using at the moment. It's just a, it's a, a three point gain. Um, and this section here is known as the B scan. Uh, it's basically just a profile, so imagine, imagine we're just taking a slice through the earth, um, like a slice through a cake, and we're looking at the layers in it. Um, and then a C scan, or C section, is when you have a cube of data, and you, you slice uh, parallel to the XY plane, and you take your time slices. Um, and when they talk about slicing 3D data or dicing 3D data, that's what you're doing, you're working with a C scan. Uh, in 2D mode, you don't see that, obviously, because we don't get 3D data. Um, along the bottom here, so you have the main menu things along the bottom here. Uh, it tells you the state of your battery. Uh, this tells you the state of your data storage. So there's no data stored here um, uh, on board. 
And if you have a GPS connection connected, this tells you the uh, PDOC uh, values for your, um, your, your GPS. So it tells you the quality of your <coughs> GPS uh, signal. And that goes from uh, gray means there's nothing connected, white is connected, yellow is uh, not great, uh, green and then red is it, sorry, red is not connected, uh, and green is if you've got uh, good coverage. Um, on the bottom here, we can reinitialize the antenna by pressing. So there's uh, just underneath this button on the console here are some hard keys one, two, three, six hard keys. And the, what we can do with those hard keys changes depending on which menu function we are in. At the moment, we can reinitialize the antenna. We can change the, the gain of the system so I can turn the gain up. Um, and you can see on the right hand side here. So we're going to start clipping the data. You can see the data is clipping over here. Um, and we get over gain data. You see to black, black and white, we lose all the detail. And we can turn the gain right up until everything just looks horrible. <laughs> um, so, but this system always records raw data. So even if you break something over here, it's got the real data inside that you can get back. So you can fill as much as you like just about uh, without damaging the data. The, the data records, does that have the three-point gain on it? Uh, no, it's, it'll be raw data, but it has a head, it has header information that will tell you what gain was used here, um, and will tell you how many gain points were used, what the gain values in, uh, uh, for that is. Um, it will tell you what antenna is attached, it will tell you the date, uh, date and time that the, the file was collected. Um, it tells you whether there's bandwidth filter applied, uh, it basically gives you all the stats for the data file that you're recording. So when you plug it in, um, you have raw data, so uh, it, and it stores a header information in a different file. Um, so this information is, this information here, the raw data is uh, stored in a DZT file. So when you download the data, you'll see it's, uh, two or three different uh, files sets, depending on what data you collect. 2D, you'll see a DZT file which contains the raw data and a DZX file which contains the header information. Uh, if you click in 3D data file there will also be a file uh, called a DZB file uh, but it stands out because it's, it's only, there's only one of them. So let's say you've collected 20 uh, parallel lines in a, in a 3D survey. Um, there'll be 20 DZT file, 20 DZX files, and one DZB file. And the DZB file tells the software in which order to arrange the other 20 files uh, because there's different ways to collect the data. Um, so we can zoom in on the data here, um, and it's not, I just need to point out, when we zoom in on the data, it's not, we, we can't zoom in on like uh, this little square here, it's not like a, 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 a TV or something like that. What we're doing is we're actually just stretching the data in the X, Y. Yeah. So here um, we have, let's say, uh, I'm guessing probably uh, 600 traces along here. If I turn that up to 2, uh, we actually, it doesn't make any concept. You can actually see now that we're, we're actually stretching the data and you can compress it, it goes both ways. So, right. so you can actually zoom in or zoom out depending on what you're doing. Um, when, when you, uh, you lifted it up, like when you did the move, what was it recording? Was it like the space that you made? Yeah, it was just recording. So it was just a longer travel time for the, the signal to hit the ground coming out of the antenna. So while, while it's sitting like this, the travel time to hit, hit. so that's, that there is the surface of the carpet basically, or the, the concrete. And if I do this, I'm just moving the antenna further away, and so that surface moves down a little bit. That's all it was doing. So, I mean, uh, that's like fake data, but that's what it was doing. Um, we can, what's all the cursor? I can't remember what that does. Oh, there we go. So we can actually, we can actually move. So if we want to, in real time, we want to get a depth to a target. So let's say the depth to that uh, 
to this black line up here. We can actually move that in and go, okay, that's the depth. And if you look at the top right hand side here, we can read off the depth. So you don't have to save the data, which is quite nice. All the systems you would have to save the data, then go into playback mode to be able to do this. And you can switch that on or off. We, you can't see it now because we're not moving, but this little yellow line here, when we collect data, if we go over a target, we see the target, so we get a nice, let's say, let's say it's a half or we just see a diffraction, uh, we can then move backwards, when we move backwards, this little yellow line will actually move a track across the screen until we move it back until it's back over the data, and then you can put in that cursor, and then you get a, a crosshair on the, on the target. And then you would be able to read its X and Y, um, sorry, its uh, X and Z uh, coordinates off the screen. Um, Play mode. Uh, play mode, I think, is just basically for playing back the data that you've already collected um, and file info. So that's the information that's contained in the header. So it'll tell you, okay, the transmit rate for this antenna, oh, that's interesting. So when these antennas were first developed, they transmitted at 800 kilohertz. So we basically sampling at a thousand kilohertz, even though we're not storing all that data, which is why we get such good quality data with this antenna because you can stack and get rid of the random noise. So our old analog antennas were at a hundred kilohertz. It's ten times the speed. So, uh, so this tells us how many samples per scan. So if we go back to here, this trace is made up of, of discrete samples. <coughs> Um, so this trace here is actually represented by 512 samples and we can tell that from here. We can change that to 1024, 2048, 4000 and something and then you need, uh, it won't go more than that for this antenna I don't think. So you're only, only if you're doing things really, really deep stuff do you need more than about 1024 samples. Otherwise you're just wasting storage space, you're not getting any additional information out of it. Um, scan rate, uh, this is saving a hundred a second at the moment, um, we're using a dielectric of 8, that's just a basic dielectric, it tells us the antennas are 350. Um, time range, so what happens is the antenna sends out a signal and it has to listen for a certain amount of time for the, for the signal to come back, so that is related to We've told it we want to. Uh, it doesn't say that much here. We've told it we want to scan to three and a half. So this will be four meters. So this is set up to scan to four meters now. So that correlates with the dielectric of eight. That correlates to a listening time, two-way travel time of eighty nanoseconds. Right. So as we set the thing up to go deeper, um, you'll see that'll change to maybe a hundred, or hundred and five, or hundred and twenty. Um, and so that's just basically how long does the system listen before it cycles to the next one, listens for the next returning wave. Um, position offset is the offset between, it takes into account this little, the distance between, as the signal uh, is sent out and the, the first peak hitting the first uh, ground basically. So it's, it's, it, that accounts for the gap between the bottom of the antenna and the ground. Uh, the antenna capsule, so we've got two capsules, we've got this big capsule to keep everything clean, and which is now a finger off the ground. Then we've got an antenna capsule inside, and inside built into that antenna uh, capsule are the two antennas themselves, the little, they look like little uh, bow ties, and those will be maybe 8 centimeters or 5 centimeters off the bottom of this antenna. And so that, that value there compensates for this. So we set it up, if you set it up automatically, you can, you can adjust it yourself if you want to, but if you set it up automatically, it just does a, a little statistical thing and use a percentage and it, it looks for that first peak and then it just backs itself up a fraction so that you can see that you're not losing that first peak. Otherwise you don't know, you might be focused, you might actually have done it wrong and you might be doing that peak there or that peak there and you're losing all this data, you wouldn't know. So. Um, no GPS, um, so at the moment, uh, as I said, the servo wheel, the right hand rear wheel is attached to a, a distance encoder, it will only click uh, information when you move forward, 
Um, and it's going to um, it's going to uh, collect 50 scans or 50 traces per meter. So we're going to get a data point every two centimeters. We can change that. Uh, I believe with this machine we can go to one centimeter or four centimeters. Um, in general, uh, high high at one or one or two centimeters per scan is, is a reasonable uh, thing. If you do, if you're looking for uh, long flat horizontal stuff and you want to keep uh, information on the screen, because remember the screen can only display X amount of traces at a time. So if you went to uh, uh, um, uh, if you went to 25, so you're yeah, only doing a, a scan every four centimeters, you would see more of the ground on the screen at any given time. So sometimes if you're looking for bigger things, it's better. But you'll you'll figure that out when you when you work with the system. Great question. Um, and then this is so this tells you what uh, the gain points are. So remember, I said three points. So we uh, <coughs> that should actually be negative. I don't know why it says the T. Normally, I'd expect that to be negative because you're actually turning this first gain point down. You can see there's it's a negative gain. You've actually degained it. Um, so 13 decibels, 42 decibels, 53 decibels. And as we can put some more in, and you'll see if you had a uh, five point gain or eight point gain, you'll see five, five numbers or whatever. Um, so here we've got an infinite impulse response low pass filter. So with digital, so with digital filters use an IIR uh, filter. Uh, with analog filters, you use a finite infinite, finite infinite response filter. And it's to stop the ringing when you filter data. You get that, that you get ringing at the, at the beginning of the filter cutoff. Um, and it's a different way of stopping it for digital and analog. It's probably more complicated than that, but that's as much as I know. So, so we use, but anyway, it, it puts this in for you. So with an analog, if you had an analog antenna attached to this, you would then be able to choose between whether you wanted an IR filter or an FIR filter. Um, and you would use an FIR filter. Although having said that, I've seen them set up wrong and I can't see the difference in the data myself. So. So, so if we make the high pass filter much lower, say 30, you would start to see the 55 or, or 60 hertz noise in the electric. That's a good point. I have, I've just been asked of that question about the mag data. Um, I mean, it's kind of Yeah, because I mean, you, you saw, if you're sampling. Because your high sampling, pass is so high. Yeah, we're sampling yeah. fast enough to actually be able to pull the 50 hertz data out. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not aware of this having a, a, a notch filter in it, because then you would have to choose 50 or 60 hertz. Well, I mean, your high pass is above 50 anyways right now, so. Oh, no, sorry, yeah, the high pass, sorry, I was, yeah, I was thinking low. Yeah, it's backwards. Um, <laughs> I mean, so, it's um, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good question. With this antenna, you can't change, as far as I know, you can't change these settings. Oh, it's okay. sort of dummy proof, uh, but it would be an interesting thing to do with the analog antenna. Mm -hmm. Is to see if you, if you crank that because for a 400 megahertz antenna, this would be set at again. This would be set at 100. Um, that would be 800. Um, for a 100 megahertz antenna, that would be set at about 20, mm -hmm. 25. So you might see you, you might record your, your 50 hertz noise. Mm -hmm. Good point. I haven't been asked that. Before. So anyway, so that's the information that's in, in the in the header, and that that goes with so every file here, every file that we have will have that information attached to it. It's just a text file as well, so uh, you can read it just with a normal notepad, notepad or whatever. Uh, right. So now setting up the system. So the first time you use it, or you go into the field under a certain circumstances. We're going to go to the radar settings here, enter. So um, we've got different types of modes that you can use with this antenna. We can use distance mode and time mode. And I see point mode appears to be grayed out. I don't know if you can use it with this antenna. So distance mode is exactly as we have it now. It's connected up to a distance encoder and will only start connecting data as you move. Um, time mode, as soon as you press uh, start, it'll start collecting data. It doesn't care whether you're moving or not. So time mode is, uh, for example, 
If you have a very, very tight area that you're working in, you would have an external handle attached to the antenna. You don't have a, a survey wheel, and you've marked every meter or every two meters. And as you go along, let's say every two meters, you press mark, and you put a mark in the data, you put a mark in the data at every two meters. Then you can go back and you can do what they call distance normalization to uh, account for the fact that your walking speed may be uh, slower and faster. Um, and then what it does is it just basically uh, stretches, uh, uh, strip decimates the data until you have X amount of traces between each mark. Yeah. Um, all right. So in general, with a cart, you would use uh, distance mode. So in general you would use distance mode, but there are times when you might want to use time mode and you might want to use time mode with uh, different antennas. So for example, uh, if you had a hundred or borrowed some of these hundred megahertz, like you went to Alton and said, can we borrow your, your he's got a 40 megahertz air launched antenna, which is lovely, uh, that works with the system. Um, and that doesn't have a, a, a wheel, you use a GPS to point to that. Um, point mode is if you're doing things, something like a CMP type survey, where you have an offset uh, transmitter and receiver. Um, and point mode is also used in geological applications where you have a lot of noise and you're trying to penetrate as deep as you can. And they typically be used with our very low frequency antennas, the 16 megahertz and, and 80 megahertz uh, antennas would use point mode. Um, with the modern antennas like this, for the 10 meters that this can really penetrate to, uh, that's spurious. You would never ever waste your time just trying to do individual scans at one meter intervals, for example. Um, the calibration of this, I'm not going to fiddle with now, um, because we don't have 10 meters. Um, so I just use a little back arrow to get out of it. So what we'll do is, uh, I want to check that this is calibrated. So to calibrate the system, you would use uh, a 10 meter line, or a 5 meter line, or a 20 meter line, straight line, uh, mark it out, go to the start, and it's all, it's all menu driven, which is lovely. You press uh, calibrate, um, that's in one of these things here. Um, calibrate the survey wheel, move it to the start, start, press start, move it to the end, press stop if you're happy, press accept. Uh, I'm not going to do it now because then we can't move it inside. So that's calibrate the distance? That's, so that's, yeah, so that's, sorry, that's only calibrating the, the distance that you measure. To make sure, because we have carts with different size wheels, um, and also I've seen with my demo cart, the, the tread's worn off the wheels. It doesn't seem much, but if you take that much off of a, the perimeter of a, of a circle, it reduces the radius, the, the, the exact much of the radius it reduces the, the perimeter by a significant amount. So maybe 5% out or something like that. So when the wheels wear, and also sometimes you might want to recalibrate if you're working in thick sand, where the wheels turn but they're also sliding a bit, um, or in thick grass sometimes as well, when the wheels aren't working you know, exactly as you would like them to work. Um, yeah. So we're working in distance mode, uh, scans per second. Um, I don't know what options we have. We can have you know, this is basically just how many scans we are saving per second, um, but we're not actually writing those to the screen. Um, Samples for scan. So yeah, you could actually go up to uh, 2048 for this antenna, no, 2024. So this actually realizes that 2048 would be a waste on a 10 meter data set. And so I would leave it at 1024. You've got enough data storage uh, to have that. Um, your eye won't see the total difference here, really. So, uh, scans per meter. We have 50. I think. I think we can go up to. Gosh, I didn't realize we could get this kind of resolution. But you can see what's happening up here. Is uh, we're getting more and more scans per given meter on the screen. And eventually, what happens is you're looking at such a narrow window of the Earth, you can't actually understand what you see. Um, normally, for for most things, 50 scans a meter works quite well. Um, certainly, for the, what we'll do when we go to try and scan and find something, 50 works well. But there's nothing wrong with I would, earn, I would have too many scans rather than too few because otherwise you start undersampling your data. Um, and so if you have 
you're looking for hypothetically a pipe this big and you're only uh, sampling every once every half meter, chances of you seeing that slim. Um, meters per mark, so that's just really the scale on the top there. You can change the scale on the top there. Dielectric. Um, so th here's a, a nice little tool. So remember I said you have these tables and you can just look up the dielectric. So when you first go out, you're just taking a guess. So if we went out onto water water lawns here, I would say probably there's been that some rain and they've been sprinkling maybe. Um, it would probably be a little bit uh, more, more uh, moist. So I would use a higher dielectric. But let's say I don't know what dielectric to use. So we can go down to the table here and we can select from the table and we can go, so we can start with the dry, or snow and ice, which we don't have already. Uh, <laughs> Dry sand, so this is this is sort of like uh, Kalahari soils, beach sand away from the uh, from the uh, way above the high, high tide mark. Um, sil high, uh, silica rich soils, basically stuff that doesn't have much clay. Um, pavement is what the Americans call tar roads. Sorry, <laughs> yes. Um, so pavement is if you would be working, we're working on a tar road. Um, that is dilated uh, 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 for six. Um, rock, dielectric of eight, uh, bas the basalts, is it basalts in Bushveld, is it? They're about 11 to 12, uh, so it depends on there, you've got to know a little bit about what, what you're working on. Um, but again, we have the tools to actually solve these problems anyway on board. So this is just the first guess. Dry soil, average soil. So let's say we're working out there, I've got an average soil, and it says, okay, for average soil, we're going to assume it a dielectric of 14. So, I'll be honest, I would have said 12, but this knows better than me, so it's a good start. Depth range, we're looking at 3.85 meters here. So let's say we wanted to see you 5 meters. I must say it's been a while since I worked with the system. And it had, the other systems you can only choose like 3 meters, 5 meters, 8 meters, 10 meters. This one you can choose pretty much anything you want, which is quite nice. Right, you'll see the time range change there. You see that? So we can either tell it how long to listen, or we can tell it how deep we'd like to see. So if you watch the time range here, that's how long it's going to listen at given that dielectric. Right, because those three are related. Um, so if we go up to five, you can see the time range change there. And that's just the uh, relation. Okay, line track is, in a, is a, an accessory which you don't have. It's just to find live cables. You guys have no use for something like that uh, under the circumstance. So, so this, this thing you will always leave off. Just make, make a note of that. Actually, if you switch it on, nothing will happen. You'll just see a strange uh, blue or green line across the bottom of your screen and you won't know what it's about. It'll just be a horizontal. It'll actually just be a, a little noisy line across the bottom. Processing the data, so these are the filters that uh, we were asked about earlier on that are in the, uh, allow you in the data. So here again, both is auto. So um, it just I just tell it how many points I want and it sets the gain. So I can go and edit it and I can make it a... Uh, so, um, so now I'm editing, so I can go and add points. Uh, and how do I add points? Uh, yeah. On the screen. So I can go and add a point, so now it's a four point gain, let's say a five point gain, um, and then I can go down and I can actually increase. So if I press on this now, I can increase the gain just at that point. Um, so now I basically put it into manual mode. Um, if I really screwed everything up, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to clip the data, you don't want to go over like that, because then all you see is black and white, and you lose all your detail. So you want to get the gain. You want, you want pretty much everything to be at least just touching those two lines there. Um, so, yeah, maybe push it up a little bit, get those a little higher. And you can fill with as much as you like. You're not breaking the data, so it doesn't matter what you do. And of course, if you um, get it wrong, you can press reset gain over here. Um, you can uh, erase points. I'm just going to get out of here, set an exit. Um, so yeah, so you can go in and, and you can actually change change that. If you go to game mode uh, manual, 
whatever settings I leave in there, it doesn't matter where I am, it will always use those settings. So sometimes you want to compare to the amplitudes of two parallel scans to see, let's say, if there's a contaminant flow or something like that, and the structure will be the same, but you want to see the amplitudes. Mm -hmm. Then you would set it into manual so that you, you find the same gain over each, each thing. If you leave it on auto, even if I put five points here, uh, I've got five points, it'll always stay on five points, but it'll change the values of, of, the, of the gain at each of those points, depending on, so when I, when I start this up, it initializes the antenna, and it, it, it knows the strength of the signal it's sending out, and it uh, checks how well it's coupled with the earth, and uh, then it adjusts the gain to suit that situation when you start it up. And every time you start a new scan, if I start a scan here and I go and start a scan there, it'll re reinitialize itself as well. So it'll adjust the gains. Uh, but putting that into manual, you just get rid of that, that, that um, option. Can I ask on the, on the trace going down, there seems to be gaps in it. Is that just a resolution issue? No, that's there. Yeah, that's just a resolution issue, yeah. Okay. So we've got more, we've got more points on, on the screen than the, the resolution on the screen. If you put that onto a, onto a big screen, you wouldn't see that. Um, sorry? Where do you, your, your, your gain points, do you put them at points of interest or...? Yeah, so you can't, you can't uh, have um, uh, randomly spaced gain points. So you couldn't put a gain point, let's say you couldn't put a gain point there, <coughs> a gain point there, and then nothing and another gain point there. You have X amount of gain points, I think you've got eight. Um, and so it just divides up into eight sectors. So for example, if I was going to edit this, so you can see at the bottom here, there's quite a lot of gain applied to the bottom here, fair amount there, but we're losing information over here, you can see, it's very hard to see anything there. So what I would do is then I, I would might go in and say, okay, look, add another point and another point and another point. So now I've got this little section here that I can fiddle with, right? And then I can go, uh, go up to, that point and then I can gain that one. So now all I'm doing is changing the area around here. I'm not, I'm not changing this at all. So, and then you, you can actually tune it like that. And you can actually see now if I push it up a little bit and then uh, go up one and, and increase that a bit. You can see you're starting to get more information out there. So you can tune it like that. Uh, but you can't have these, uh, uh, they're always gonna be evenly spaced. Uh, okay, stacking uh, is basically how many traces, so we take uh, X amount of traces like this and we add them together and hopefully random noise will cancel itself and any real uh, real things like let's say that's a, a real uh, target that will just be amplified. So you can you can set a stacking of, that's just adding traces together, if, have you guys, for example, stacking, signal processing, you just stack things on, on and random noise disappears. To a large extent, it's the root of the function of the stacking, I think. It's the square root of the number of stacks. But, um, so there's a there's a bounding limit to how much you actually get out of it before you just slow the computer down so much. In the past, this was a big deal because computers were slow. These days, you can you can stick pretty much whatever in there. So I would normally run a, a stacking of about uh, nine, and that gives you a nice. So you'll get nice clean data. You'll see um, deeper stuff this will uh, be much more stable. Um, but again, that you're not breaking the data if you choose another number. Um, you just, it's just your representation on the screen will look a bit different. It'll look a bit different. Question. Oh, on, on, on the staking part, how is the uh, fault coverage from staking important in uh, data processing? With, with radar, it doesn't apply because you've got a coincident transmitter and receiver. You know, am I, Understand the question. Is the fault fault coverage? How many? Yeah. How is it important in radar processing? Okay. So if, if I understand the question, uh, from a seismic point of view, you would have one receiver, let's say, and twenty. Uh, sorry, one source and twenty-four receivers, and depending on your bin size, you would have X amounts of reflections coming out of one bin, and then you'd treat all the information in that one bin. Uh, you'd stack that information in that bin and produce one trace. Is that Oh, in radar we don't have. In radar we don't have that because, because have the they, they're, they're essentially on top of each other. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have that. 
you don't have that, but you also you have an, uh, a very, very high redundancy of data. So we are sampling a thousand times a second and we are filtering that. And then we are still have the ability to, to do uh, on-screen stacking as well. So, but yeah, that's a good question. But it's, it's, not the, it's not the same because you have a, a coincident, you have this, the coincident yes. the transmitter receiver. And, you know. yeah, this one here, yeah, this is an important filter. And it's one of those dangerous filters that if it's applied incorrectly, you can really screw up what you see. Yeah. So, wow. you can see if I have, so what this, what this does, I'm gonna switch it off quickly, what this does is this looks for horizontal uh, events. And it says, okay, you tell me how many traces along I must look. And if it's flat for, if I make this a, a number like 100, if this event occurs in the same place over 100 traces, I'm gonna take this event out. Then I move one trace to the right, and I go, the next 100 traces, is it flat? If it's flat, I take it out. And so you take horizontal noise out. So environmental noise uh, tends to be, um, let's say for example, you're working near a, a railway line and you have uh, that DC current draw when a, a train comes past. You get this big banding in your data. Now that may obscure the target. So how do you get rid of that? You get rid of that with a filter like this. So that's what it does. It just looks for linear stuff and it gets it out of your data. But it's a very dangerous filter because it's one of those filters that you think if you use a small number, it's, it's a softer filter. The smaller the number that you use makes it a really, really hard filter. So if I use two here, you'll see there's nothing in the data. It's gone. Sure. And basically because two points will always create a straight line. And so it sees a straight line and goes, okay, I'm taking it out. Uh, and as I dial, so this should always be like over 500. So that's the number of points it's looking yeah. for a straight well, line. Well, you see the problem now is that we're not moving. So if, if we are moving, you actually will see the data. Um, so this should be always very, very high. But having said that, I would almost always switch this off unless you have a reason to use it. Unless you see in your data, and it typically will happen, it'll typically happen, um, It'll typically happen when you are pushing the limits of the antenna. So if you've got the depth set at eight or ten meters, um, you will start to get ringing in the noise in the data. So you get these uh, because this is false because we're standing still, but you get horizontal banding. It's almost like multiples through the data, and it's basically because you've been so much power through the antenna, it starts to ring like ringing a bell, um, and then you can use that to get rid of it. But you always use a, a very long filter, like a thousand or over 500 but a thousand and if you use i had a customer who brought a machine back to me who said that the machine's broken and they caused 800,000 rands damage to an electrical cable in a suburb that they were being sued for and he said your equipment's broken and i switched it on and luckily it has this thing and it goes wait a minute you're using a, a bandpass filter of two so i just stripped everything out of his data and it was in the data still but he wasn't looking at the raw data he was looking at what he Interpretation on screen, so it cost them close to a million rand. So yeah, it can be a, a dangerous thing. Um, and then, okay, so this is quite a neat little thing. This is just a statistical um, uh, analysis of the data. So what it does is says, okay, listen, I know the peak power that I'm outputting into the ground. Once the antenna is initialized, I know the amount of coupling I'm getting with the earth, and I've set my gains to a certain uh, limit and I expect now to get uh, a minimum signal level back that I can interpret signal to noise ratio so what this does is statistically it works out when your signal to noise ratio gets below a preset threshold which the algorithm decides on it will give you this line so anything down below here this is really saying to us that in theory because this is all wrong because we're not moving and we're not we've got a hollow underneath us but this is basically would be saying to us listen we're only getting three meters depth penetration now the rest is garbage or potentially garbage. Sometimes you can still get information out of here, but be very cautious about what your interpretations are done in this area. So when you go out onto the onto the grass or whatever, and you have this little signal force switch on, it will go up and down, it will it will move up and down, sort of like that kind of thing. Well, quite as much as that, but it'll zigzag and it'll tell you, okay, listen, that's potentially garbage. 
And it will also tell you something about the, the ground conditions. If, if this sits, if you've got a set of 10 meters and this is sitting up at one meter, you know you've got very conductive soils because you're losing all the uh, signal to noise ratio below it's low. So it's, it's a good indicator of, of the quality of, of the data, how deep you can expect to penetrate. <coughs> but you never really know. You, know. you can tell this machine to listen for probably 200 nanoseconds and it will try. It might be a measuring garbage. So that, that I like to be one. It's, a, it's a pretty cool. And, and they tell you how they calculate that, or uh, no, because it's proprietary. <laughs> um, no, they won't tell us the algorithm, but I might. I could, if you want to, I can ask uh, and see if I can get a bit more information. If you're interested. But yeah, it's uh, this algorithm and the algorithm that they use for the hyperstacking are proprietary. So I, I know sort of how the hyperstacking works, but they won't tell me too many details. Output. Okay, this is just, just basic stuff. Selecting data paths, so where you can create folders to store, sort of store your data. So you could create a project folder like bits uh, or an address of a building or whatever. You would just go in and, and just use the. So this one has probably testing in, in, testing in, uh, uh, in the lab. Um, everything by default is stored in common. Um, so you have a common uh, 2D and a common 3D depending on which mode you're working in. Um, so if you don't change it, it'll just go into common. Um, but you can actually go, so let's say, let's say I was working with a radar today, I could create a folder called Terry and I have all my, all my data stored in Terry. And then you could go and use it and then set it up for you. And they're on the drive, but they're in different forms. It's just an organizational system. Uh, vertical scale is depth. You can have time as well if, you, if you're actually interested in the nanoseconds that you're looking at. Um, and height. Height is an interesting one. It's when you're scanning, uh, oh. scanning both the hanging wall or ceiling. Yeah. So the, what it actually does is, I think it does, it should flip this over. Mm. Yeah. So there, there's the zero, except we have to switch the scale because it doesn't note. <laughs> so you have zero here and five meters the other way. Uh, anyway, yeah. Vertical units, meters or centimeters. Uh, it's up to you. Horizontal units, the same thing. Uh, so, okay, here you've got a lot of choices. Um, oh, sorry, this is scale color, white on black. Uh, but if, depending on where you're working, sometimes it's better to have black on white. Um, that just changes the scale color. If you're printing out things like if you're using that in a report, you'd prefer that to that. Um, these are just different things that don't really matter. Uh, in sunlight, that works better. Um, so this just shows, um, just, uh, when we start collecting data, uh, if, with this off, that will disappear. It just gives you more real estate on the screen. Uh, it's a personal preference. I quite like being able to see that, to be honest. But it's, it's up to you. Uh, show hyperbola. Um, okay, so this is your hyperbolic matching tool. So you would go and say, okay, I want to um, match it up. Um, when we collect data, we use that tool to determine the, the or to estimate the dielectric. Um, color map. Okay, so this this one you can fiddle with. You can have lots of fun with this. You can change the, the colors of the. You see, this is the color map up here. So we've got grayscale where we are putting in uh, greens and reds for certain events. Um, and there's hundreds of these. Things. You see which one we were on. So 11 is the standard that there will be. It will be in the manual there. Uh, 11 is the standard uh, uh, sort of infinite grayscale with black on the left uh, and white on the right. You can also swap, swap this around. Uh, this one is quite nice when you have your uh, uh, maximum blue, maximum positive is blue, maximum negative is red. Sometimes in sunlight, these that help you to actually see the maximum. Uh, but this, you can have lots of fun with these things, and uh, <laughs> some of them are some of them are really bad. They're, they're not great for data because they just they they get rid of finer detail. Uh, your eye grayscale is, is pretty good because your eye is your rods and cones in your eyes. So your eyes are are very sensitive, seeing subtle differences in grayscales. Um, so you can pick up detail in, in the data in gray. But sometimes in sunlight, 
it doesn't work. And then you've also got the you've also got the traditional seismic point where it is. I think it's like 27. I didn't realize this one had there we go. I didn't realize this one had so many different options. The other consoles only have like four options. Uh, but this is one of them. Stretch. Okay. This is this is again. You can fiddle with this if you want. So what happens is um, we have uh, a number of bins here that each of those colors of amplitudes are, are represent. Each color or each shade represents an amplitude. You can shift that whole binning system to the right or binning system to the left just by applying a positive or negative color stretch to it. You can do really weird things to your data. Again, you're not destroying the data, you're just destroying the way you're looking at it. Um, and color slide just basically moves the, the center point of your color scale to the right and to the left. So it doesn't change the bin sizes. Um, but yeah, you can have fun with those. Those are the things that you can play with for hours if you don't feel inclined to. So. setup that you really like or you can tell me sorry um, can you just tell me well you guys have to they were needed okay so point, we're so. almost done here so i would have showed you everything you know to be able to use a system yes. from from now so um basically if you have a, a favorite setting so you go and you set all the games set whatever you've, you've set so far you can go and save that setup and at any stage if you want to revert uh, if you want to recall that, you're going back into there and recall that setup. Um, and uh, this GPS, if you have a GPS system, you use that to get the board rate of this the same as the board rate of your GPS. This has all the usual 4800 up to 128, whatever it is. So you just set that up to match your, your GPS. Um, and then the last thing is calibrate survey wheel. Um, and so calibrate the survey wheel basically set it up in quadrature mode, I don't know why they've named it quadrature, I'm not sure, maybe it's a four wheel cart or something. Um, you select the distance, you can change this distance, but it defaults to 10, 10 is a decent distance. Um, this is a save value, 3850, so that's probably about right for this cart. Um, so it just tells you that, select the calibration distance, position the antenna on the start mark, so you can make marks up 10 meters. Uh, you use one of these, or any mark on, the, on here, as long as it's consistent. Uh, you press the start button, so you press start over here, uh, you walk it to the end in a straight line, uh, you get that same point marked up at the end, you press, uh, when you get to there, say press stop, so once you start moving here, uh, I'm not going to do it, but once you start, it'll go, this, this will count will start to change, and when you get to the end, you press stop, if you're happy with it, you press apply, and it's calibrated. You don't have to calibrate it, it's not like you have to calibrate it every time you use it, um, and see if you put it in a different cart or if something changes like when the wheels get really old um, in the interest of time I'm just going to press cancel um, so yeah and it's, 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 it's menu driven it's explained very well if you, I'll tell you right now if you ever start to collect data and nothing happens you just get a, a white screen um, if you just get a white screen it's almost certainly that you fiddle with calibration and that little, that little number was zero, and you haven't saved it. It doesn't know, it doesn't know it's moving. That's why. Almost all the times when people phone me and go, it's stopped working, I go, check your survey wheel calibration, somebody's filled. But you can get to that. Yeah, it's very easy. Okay. You just go into, into uh, uh, settings, so calibrate survey wheel, and recalibrate it. But then, there's a couple of important things. Don't break the wheels. And be careful with that pattern, unfortunately. And the batteries, what is the best way to manage the batteries? Should they be kept full? Should yeah, they be like very empty? Expensive. Yeah, I know. Very, very, and we do a terrible job with batteries. Yeah, um, these are actually very good batteries. They don't have to be 
you don't have to discharge them. Um, if they discharge, I wouldn't leave them for more than a few weeks. Uh, it's, it's always good protocol to, when you finish the survey, to charge them back inside. Um, but you can leave them for uh, literally months. If they're fully charged, you put them on a shelf for six months. So they should be kept fully charged? Yeah, they should be okay. kept fully charged wherever possible. Okay. And you can't overcharge them, it's a smart charger. But they are expensive batteries, they're like 4,000 or 5,000 rand a battery. Mm -hmm. That's excluding shipping costs. Oh,